What's going on guys welcome back in today's video we're going to talk about recursion now this is a very important topic to understand especially for intermediate programmers because you're going to encounter it everywhere however a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their mind around this concept because it's kind of abstract and confusing especially for beginners so in today's video i want to give you a simple straightforward and easy to understand introduction into recursion recursive thinking and recursive programming in general for this we're going to start by looking at the theoretical foundation we're going to talk about the theoretical structure of recursive functions. Then we're going to talk about advantages and limitations of recursion. And then we're going to look at a couple of examples uh, of functions implemented iteratively and recursively. We're going to compare the two ways and we're going to talk about advantages and disadvantages. All right, so what I want to mention right away is that every function, every algorithm can be implemented iteratively and recursively. So one paradigm is not more powerful than the other one. We cannot do something iteratively that we cannot do recursively and vice versa. Every iterative function can be rewritten in a recursive way and vice versa. Sometimes one paradigm is going to be more suited to a specific task, but basically they're equally powerful. Now recursion is essentially when a function calls itself. So if I have a function my function and this function inside of the function block calls itself, this is recursion. So in Python, and this is, by the way, language independent, so recursion is not a principle in Python. You can do that in Java, or you will need that in Java, in C++, C, PHP, JavaScript, whatever. Uh, so if I say def my function, and inside of that function I have some code, for example, print hello, and then I call this function, this function calls itself, this is recursion. So I have the function my function, and inside of that function it calls itself, this is recursion. Now, in this case, it's an endless recursion and that has a certain uh, problem. And this is a stack overflow error. Now in Python, we're not gonna get a stack overflow error because in Python, we have a recursion depth limit. So think about it when my function calls itself, it calls itself, which means that it's going to call itself all the time because the thing that it calls is itself and this thing calls itself again. So there's no end to that. And if I run this, you will see that we will get an error. We're not going to get a stack overflow error. We're going to get a recursion error because the maximum recursion depth was exceeded. Now we can change that value. We can manipulate that value and allow for more uh, depth. But however, we're not going to be able to do this endlessly. We're going to hit a limitation. In other programming languages, we don't have necessarily a limit. We have a stack and this stack is basically a memory where we, say, uh, where we save the jump back address every time we call a function we uh, we put the return address onto the stack and once the function is done processing we're going to return to that however we only return to that if the function terminates at some point if we constantly keep calling and calling new functions without actually returning at some point we're going to fill up the stack with return addresses and then it's going to be full and it has to uh, to break down causing a stack overflow basically so this is what the stack overflow error is uh, and this can happen with recursion, cannot happen with the iterative approach. This is a limitation of recursion. However, an advantage of recursion is that oftentimes writing functions and algorithms in a recursive way is more intuitive, it's more clear, it's more elegant, it's more mathematical, you could say. Sometimes it leads to less debugging time and less development time. And sometimes we can even reduce time complexity by using a recursive approach. However, sometimes we can also increase the time complexity and we're going to take a look at that in today's video as well. Uh, when we look at the Fibonacci sequence, an example that I have shown on this channel uh, quite uh, a lot of times already. And for some tasks like, for example, tree traversals, uh, the recursive approach is just more intuitive and just better overall because it's more straightforward. We see what it's doing. Um, so let's talk about the theoretical structure, the theoretical foundations of recursion. Essentially, a recursive function has to have a base case, a base case, a termination point, if you want, a point where after some recursive calls, we get to a point where we can finally return. So if we have a function again, def my function, and we do something in that function, I have to have a case where if certain conditions are met, I can finally return a static value. So not return another function call, but return something like one or maybe a larger number, doesn't matter, some value, 
something that terminates. Some at some point, I need to stop uh, stop the recursive calls. I need to to have this base case where I can say now I'm done. Now I'm at this point where I don't do any more recursive calls. So I can go back and if you want, unravel all the recursive calls, return to all the addresses and return the final value. So this is the base case. Then another principle is, or the second principle, there are only two, two principles here. The first one is the base case. The second one is with each recursive call, we need to be progressing towards that base case. Uh, and those two statements might sound a little bit abstract and theoretical, which is why they might be confusing. What is a base case? What does it mean to be progressing towards that base case? So we're going to start with a very simple example. Let's say we want to have a function, we're going to start with an iterative approach, we're going to have a function that counts the zeros in a list of numbers. So we're going to have a list of numbers up here, my list. <clears throat> and we're going to have a bunch of zeros in here. And other values. like that. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six zeros. Now we're going to write the function count zeros, we're going to pass a list here. And iteratively, this is kind of easy, we're, we're just saying the counter is going to be zero. And no, we're not going to use the count function of Python, obviously, we're going to write it ourselves. Uh, we're going to say counter equals zero, and then four n or four x in list, we're just going to say, if the value that I'm currently looking at is a zero, we're going to increase the counter by one. And once I'm done, I'm going to return the counter. So if I call count zero on my list, I should get six as a result. So let's no, not debug this come on. Let's just run this. Of course, we should print the result. If we want to see it. And there you go, six is the result. So this is a very simple iterative approach, there's no recursion in here. Now we're going to implement the same function in a recursive way. And for this, we're going to call it count zeros recursive, or recursively. And we're going to pass a list here as well. Now we're not going to use any loops here, we're going to use recursion. And we can also not use in a meaningful way, a local variable. Why? Because if I have something like counter equals zero, think about it, if I say counter equals zero, and then I do some counter plus equals one or something. And then I call the function. Uh, so let's say I do it in, in a certain case, instead of iterating, I do it recursively, and then I increase the counter if I find something, it doesn't work, because when I call this function, or when the function calls itself, it's going to reinitialize that counter to zero. So the only thing that we could do is we could use a global variable. So we can say something like, um, counter equals zero out here, and then I can access this counter, I can make it global and work with it. But that's not really a clean recursive approach. So we're going to do it without that we need to think of a different solution. Now, the recursive approach here would be to process each element individually. Let's say we have the function already implemented, how would it work? So let's say this function works already, we have to trust it. What we would do is we would take this list here, and we would say, okay, in order to count the zeros, what I could do is I could just look at the first element and say, either zero or one. So a zero, if it's not a zero and a one, if it's, uh, if it's a zero, so we count up, but we count up by adding to the return value. So what we do is we say, okay, take the first element, if it's a zero, add one to the to the final result, otherwise, add nothing or add zero to the final result. In this case, it would be zero plus call the function on the rest of the list. So we remove that first element up until now we have zero, plus this function applied to that remaining list. This again would do the same thing, it would look at the first element in this case a zero and say, Okay, I have a one here, plus whatever this function returns on the rest of the list. So I remove again, the first element here, I would have a zero, then a zero again, because we have a three here. And then we would have again, a one, and so on. So we basically just look at one element and say zero or one, depending on if it's a zero or not. And then we just trust the function to accurately process the rest of the list. 
However, what do we do when we reach the last element? This is where the base case comes into play because we need to have a terminating base case where we say, okay, now this is uh, the point where we don't do any more recursive calls. This is where we just return zero or one. So in the end, if we have a bunch of data, so we have like plus one, plus zero, whatever, plus one, plus one, plus zero. And then in the end, we have only one element left. Then instead of returning a function call, we just return one or zero, in this case, zero, because it's a two. So let's get into the implementation before this gets too confusing. What we want to do as a general rule is we want to define how is the counting going to happen. And the counting is going to happen by just saying, okay, if the first element of the list, so if list zero, if that equals to zero, all I'm going to return here as a result is I'm going to return one because I already found one zero plus the function applied to the rest of the list. Pause the video if you don't understand it, think through it. What we're doing here is we're looking at the first element. If it's a zero, I already found a zero. So I add one to the return result. And then I trust this function. Of course, we need to, to uh, specify here that we're cutting off the first uh, the first digit. So what we're doing here is we're removing the first element that we already have here, either zero or one. And then we apply the same function here on the rest of the list. And of course, we need an else branch. So if the value is not zero, we're just going to return zero plus count zeros recursively list one until the end. However, instead of adding zero, we can also remove that I'm going to leave it here just because it's a little bit more intuitive to understand what's happening. This is the exact same thing, but it might be a little bit confusing if you're already confused uh, and not able to understand recursion. Those are basically the two branches. We have the first element is zero. So one plus count the zeros in the rest of the list. The first element is not zero, for example, a two. So zero plus count the rest of the list. And of course, when we call that function, it's going to do the exact same thing. The only thing that we need to do is we need to formulate a base case so that when the list is uh, only having one last element, we want to have the case that, okay, the length of the list is equal to one. So there's only one element left. Then we're going to return one if this element is equal to zero and else we're going to return zero. This is just a ternary operator, basically the same thing as saying if it's zero, return one, else return zero. And one base case that might make sense, not because we're going to reach it through recursion, but because we might pass an empty list, we can also formulate a base case for an empty list. So then of course, zero is the result. This is optional, you can you can ignore that if you are already confused. So let's go through the process one more time, we have this list, we pass it to the recursive function, what happens is, it says, okay, the length of the list is not one because we have a couple of values in here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to look at the first element. Is it a zero? No, it's not. It's a two. So let's go to this branch. We have zero zeros plus whatever we have in the rest of the list. So what we do is we call this again with the rest of the list. This time is going to go into that branch and say, okay, it's one. So this here is actually that statement here because we reached that statement we have a zero already plus in this case it would be that statement. So that would be unraveled what we already have. And this goes on and on and on until we finally reach the base case that returns one if the last remaining element is zero and else it returns zero. This is the recursive approach for counting zeros. We can call that function by saying count zeros recursively in my list. And you can see that the result is six. So it works the same way that the iterative approach works. Uh, but it's a little bit more complicated. So if you didn't understand that, go back into the video, pause it, think about it, what's happening, we're just processing each element one by one. And then we're trusting the function to be able to solve the problem, the same problem for the rest of the list until we reach a base case. And then once we reach that base case, all these function calls are going to be replaced by the actual values that they're returned. So it's going to be a chain of one plus zero plus zero plus one and so on. Uh, and then it's going to be added up to the final result, which is six in this case. Now the second example that we're going to look at is going to be a function that finds the minimum of a list. 
And the iterative approach for this is quite simple. We're going to say find min. By the way, I have changed the list a little bit so we have a little bit more diverse values. We're going to pass a list here. We're going to say the minimum is going to be assumed to be the first element of the list just because we're naive and we're going to believe that un unless we find something else, unless we find a counterexample and then we're going to look for that counterexample by saying for x in uh, in list if x is less than the minimum that we assumed we're going to just say that the new minimum is going to be x and then we're going to return that in the end. So in this list, the minimum is one. So if I apply find min to my list, we should get a one as a result. There you go, we get one as a result. So that's the iterative approach, quite simple. The recursive approach is um, actually similar to the counting zeros approach. We look at the first element and then we change the minimum function. So what we're going to do, uh, not change, we're going to chain the minimum function. So what we're doing here is we're going to say find min recursive and essentially we can find the minimum of the whole list by just saying and this is going to be uh, the actual progression towards the base case um, and this is just going to be the minimum of the first value and whatever minimum we get for the rest of the list so we're going to call recursively find min recursive and we're going to call this on list, except for the first element. Uh, by the way, I didn't mention that for the first example, this is the progression towards the base case, because we said we need a progression towards the base case. This is given because the base case, and in this case, it's also going to be the base case, if the list, if the length of the list is equal to one, then we're going to just return the respective value as the minimum of the list. This is the base case. So the base case is that the length of the list is one. And since we're constantly decreasing the list length by one, this is a progression towards the base case. This is given here. We have a base case and we have the progression towards that base case. Uh, here again, we can of course say if the length of the list equals zero, we're just going to return none because there are no elements in the list. But this is the actual base case that we're progressing towards. And what we're doing here essentially is we're saying, okay, the minimum of the list is going to be the minimum that I have here. So 10, the first, ele the first element is the minimum of this, this uh, one value because it's just one value. And then we have the rest of the list for which we're going to do the same thing. So for that list, 99 is going to be the minimum. And if it stays the minimum, the final uh, unraveling of the recursions is going to be comparing 10 and 99. But from that list, when we call this function over and over again, the minimum that we're going to find is going to be a one. And then we're going to compare one to 10 in the last unraveling, if you want to call it that, in the last return uh, to, the, to the main function call. We're going to compare one and 10, and we're going to see that one is just a smaller value. So we're going deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, and we're going to then compare three with 22 and 22 with uh, 43 and so on. We're going to go back until we reach the main function call. And then we're going to see that one is the smallest value because it's going to be the one value that persists across all the minimum calls. All right, so let's run that. We're going to print find min recursive off my list. Come on. And we're going to see that one is the result here as well. Now we're going to also talk about the Fibonacci sequence. And this is an example that I have shown you a couple of times on this channel already. It's one of those cases where you should not use recursion because it's just inefficient. So the Fibonacci sequence is a sequence of numbers that starts with zero and one. And every next number is the sum of the previous two numbers. So in this case, zero plus one would be one, one plus one would be two, one plus two would be three, two plus three would be five, three plus five, eight, and so on. Uh, up until infinity. And we can just make an iterative function, just code an iterative function to calculate the nth Fibonacci digit. So we can just say def Fibonacci n is going to be a and b are going to be the starting values and they're going to be initialized with zero and one. And then we're just going to say for some counter variable that we don't really need in range n. 
zero n we're going to just say a and b are going to be reset to a should be b so we're just going to shift it to the left and uh, then the new b is going to be a plus b which is the basic definition and once we have all iterations done the result is going to be stored in a so we can print a couple of numbers here fibonacci uh, digit zero is going to be zero then Fibonacci digit one should be one and then we can do that for two as well and then we can do that for I don't know a hundred and you can see we have zero one one the next one would be two and so on and the hundredth Fibonacci digit would be this one and you can see that this works quite well so I can also go with a thousand and it immediately calculates the result which is a huge number as you can see uh, this is the iterative approach. Now, the recursive approach is different. The recursive approach uh, is a little bit more intuitive because we understand what it does. It's essentially Fibonacci recursive n. We're basically returning the Fibonacci number before that. So n minus 1 plus Fibonacci recursive n minus 2, which is exactly the definition. To get the nth Fibonacci number, all you have to do is you have to get the n minus 1th Fibonacci number and the n minus 2th Fibonacci number. So you have to look at the previous two numbers to calculate the next number. This is the definition. This is as straightforward as it gets. And of course, we have the base cases because we need to know, okay, what is the first one and what is the zeroth one? And for this, we say if n equals zero, we're just going to return zero. And if n equals one, we're going to return one. And in this case, it's actually important to specify both base cases because we access n minus one and n minus two. So if we pass two, we're going to get one and zero at the same time. And we need to have two base cases here in this case. And of course, we're progressing towards these main cases, uh, base cases, because we're constantly subtracting numbers from n. Now, the problem with that is the runtime complexity. And before I explain to you, if you don't know this already, why this is the case, let me just show you that it is the case. So if I call Fibonacci recursive on, let's call it on small values first, on zero, on one, on two, and then maybe on 20, if I run this now, you can see that we have the same result. So I can get the uh, digits. I can also get the 20th digit. But now let's try to get the 100th digit as we did before. And now you can already see that this takes quite some time. We still don't have the result. As I'm talking here, we still don't have the result. We can wait quite a long time to get it. And especially if I enter a thousand, we can wait a very long time. Why is that the case? This is the case because here, we're not calling the Fibonacci function recursively once, we're calling it twice for each call, which means that when I call it once, the first function call calls itself two times. Those two function calls call themselves again, two times, and again, two times, two times, each call calls itself two times, or twice. This means that we have two to the power of n function calls for the input parameter n. And this is, for those of you who know a little bit about algorithmic runtime complexity, this is an exponential runtime complexity. It's in big O of two to the power of n, which is a horrible runtime complexity, especially compared to this one, which is in O of n, which is a linear runtime complexity, which is very desirable and nice to have. We're not talking about quadratic here. We're not talking about polynomial. We're not talking about cubic. We're talking about exponential runtime complexity which is a very bad complexity to have, especially compared to linear. So this, this is not good. This might be straightforward. This might be mathematical and easy to understand. It's a bad idea to do Fibonacci that way. Uh, what you can do to speed that up is you can use caching. I have a video on this channel on this. So you can type on my channel Python caching and you can find a way to speed that up using caching. But again, the iterative approach is just better. So this is not recommended here. All right, so last but not least, I want to show you how you can set the recursion limit in Python manually. And for this, we're going to have a sample function, my function, it's going to take a parameter n, and all it's going to do, it's going to print the numbers from one to n, 
and n is going to be the variable, of course, that decides the maximum. We're going to say if n equals zero, this is going to be the base case, we're just going to pass. So to basically do nothing to return. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to print n, and we're going to call the function with n minus one. So progression towards the base case, of course, only if n is positive, because if n is negative, we're not progressing towards zero, we're going up until or down until negative infinity. So you have to enter positive values here. Um, and essentially, what we can do here now is we can call my function on 10. And you will see that this essentially prints the numbers 10 down to one if I want to print, uh, if I want to count up, all I need to do is I need to do the recursion before I print, and then I'm going to reverse the order one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Uh, and of course, I can do this with 100. And I can do this with 200. But you're going to see that there's a problem if I try to do this on 1000, because we have a certain recursion depth limit. There you go, recursion error, maximum depth exceeded. I think the maximum value that it tolerates is 996, at least on my system. If I want to change that, what I want to do is I want to import sys, and then I want to say sys.set recursion limit. And for example, I can set it to 5000. So if I change that now to 2000, it will work. However, we cannot do this uh, without a limit because as I said, we have a stack and the stack is limited. So I think if I actually try to do 5000, I'm going to get an error, but I'm not going to get the recursion error, I'm going to get a stack overflow. So Python is just going to crash on me. <clears throat> and I think it will take some time for this to happen. But you can see that nothing is happening here. And eventually, it's going to crash and tell me that uh, things didn't work out because I mean, it's not going to say that it's a stack overflow, but it's going to basically crash. Maybe if I try 4000, it's going to happen faster. However, we cannot go limitless, I think there you go, we got an error here. Uh, this is basically because we did too many recursions. I don't know what the actual practical maximum is, maybe 3000 is going to work. Let's see. Uh, doesn't seem like that is the case. But you have to play around with that. But if you want to set the recursion limit for some reason, to go a little bit above the boundaries, you can do that with sys.set recursion limit. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed and hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting the like button, leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.